Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Amor, who is uh, a postdoc uh, at uh, MIT. Daniel is one of these uh, brave uh, uh, physicists that uh, has been trained in physics and then moved to do also experiments in biology and try to combine uh, theory with uh, experimental data. Uh, Daniel studied in, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona physics and then this, uh, did his PhD in uh, experimental sciences and sustainability in Girona and then uh, after a postdoc with uh, Ricardo Soleil in Barcelona moved to MIT uh, four years ago and today is going to talk about how microbial communities respond to perturbations so before uh, I leave the floor to Daniel, I just want uh, to remind the rules uh, for these uh, webinars. So there are no um, strong rules. You can uh, typically, uh, you can just uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask a question during the talk if that's fine uh, with, uh, with Daniel. Um, uh, yep, so definitely. Uh, just uh, ask questions during the talk. We try to keep it as uh, interactive as possible. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Danny, for, for accepting your invitation. Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to give this seminar today, and I'm looking forward to the discussions afterward. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'm, am I sharing the screen correctly? Is this the, are you now seeing yes. my, okay, because yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't appear as when we tried before, but if it's working, it's great, okay. How do microbial communities respond to perturbations? Um, I'm here today to uh, speak about this question and uh, I wanted to first begin by looking back at the first time in history in which this question made sense at all. And uh, our story begins in France back in the 1860s. At that time, there was, there was a huge crisis in the wine industry and uh, many, many bottles of wine were spoiled after storage. And uh, it was so bad that Napoleon itself uh, called Louis Pasteur and asked him to find a solution for this problem. At the time, Louis Pasteur has already shown the world that um, fermentation was not the purely chemical process that everybody had in mind, but instead tiny cells or tiny yeast cells were responsible for the fermentation of the precious alcohol. So this time he is facing the challenge of saving the wine industry. And for the first time in history, he takes a, a, a lot of samples of wine and starts looking at, wine, at, at the wine and, um, under the microscope. And here's what he, what he finds out. So it was usually easy for, for the uh, for the winemakers to obtain the alcohol because from the group J juice, uh, the yeast that already were living in the skin of the grapes uh, start their activity and they produce, they turn the sugars into alcohol. And after the fermentation, they naturally decrease their activity. And when every, everything goes well, um, the, the wine can be stored and uh, it, tastes, it will taste good for a long while. However, he also found out that in some cases, uh, one of the microbes one that was already in the wine will take over after fermentation and will turn the wine into a sour wine. Or in other cases, it was another microbe that will turn it into a cloudy wine or a slimy wine. And for, every, for each of the different maladies of the wine, he, he was able to find a particular microbe that was causing that, that malady. That was already a great discovery at the time, but he obviously didn't stop there. He was looking for a way to prevent this. And he, after a lot of experiments, he found out that this was the best thing to do. It was a perturbation, which consists in increasing the temperature of the wine just after the fermentation up to 50 degrees. When you do that, the 
<clears throat> the abundance of the microbes in the wine goes down uh, uh, very significantly. And it was enough to, in most of the cases, prevent uh, the emergence of any of the maladies. So this was actually the origin of uh, fermentation. Uh, many of us might know, at least I, I thought before, that fermentation started with milk, but actually it didn't. It, it started with, with wine and then it was transferred to other processes. But if we look at it from an ecological perspective, is uh, one of the first cases in which somebody intentionally drive and engineer the state of a microbial community. So from the different stable states that uh, the system uh, could, could reach, uh, Pasteur was directing it into the most desirable state, uh, which is the good wine. And today we know already many different ways, uh, the good ways of, of producing wine. However, when it comes to predicting the response of a complex microbial community to a perturbation, we are still pretty unsophisticated. So let me let me show you uh, an example related to a complex community that is the, the microbial community living in our gut. So here we have um, a study in which the scientists were uh, tracking the composition of the microbiome of a human individual. And, uh, and the different lines show groups of important taxa in, in this community. So what we see is that four weeks at the beginning, the composition uh, of these groups is pretty stable. But one day, uh, this, uh, this individual got an infection. I think it was Salmonella. And uh, from this infection, you can see how one of the groups goes up because it's, uh, the, the pathogen uh, belongs to this group. But then in a process of about two weeks, it, uh, the infection was clear. However, in the, during this process, uh, there was an alteration of the abundances of the other uh, microbes that responded to this change in the community. And uh, the study continues for many, many weeks after, and we see that uh, it reaches a different uh, kind of stability. So the composition doesn't look the same as it was before the infection, but it suggests that it has reached a different stable state of the community. Um, however, in these cases, the, the community is so complex and, uh, and we have so little control and limited ability to, to do experiments with the human gut community, obviously. So overall, it's very difficult uh, to uh, disentangle the mechanisms that are driving these transitions. And um, beyond human, uh, human health, uh, we, we have a huge problem nowadays uh, with the human activities and climate change uh, uh, challenging our ecosystems. And in many cases, uh, we know that ecosystems can also display alternative stable states. Um, some of these st stable states are also linked to microbial activity and one a uh, good example is the one of uh, lakes. So here we have a picture of uh, a lake in its oligotrophic state in which the, um, the Newton concentration is low and the biodiversity is high. However, because of human activity, sometimes uh, fertilizers come into the lake and after that phytoplankton can experience a bloom and consume all the oxygen which will kill the fauna. So we, have, we transition into this undesired state that, uh, uh, in which the biodiversity is very low and the nutrient concentration in this case is very high. Um, so again, this is also an example of a stable state and the system shows some hysteresis here because once you, once you reach this stable state is very difficult to come back to the previous one, even if you stop uh, uh, um, throwing more fertilizers into the lake. And there are many other examples, such as in our coral reefs that are uh, challenged by, by the increases in temperature and pH of the environment. Um, and in ecology, uh, many of, much of the work has been done uh, with a focus 
focus on microorganisms when we are talking about uh, the effects of climate change. But given that microbial communities are at the very heart of many ecological functions and can support biodiversity, uh, it is becoming more and more clear that it's necessary to also study the effects of uh, these changes in the environment on microbial communities in, different, in, in our different ecosystems. So my research focuses on uh, studying how microbial communities uh, respond to perturbations. And before I go into the specifics of the talk, I will just uh, give you in a nutshell, a uh, scheme of uh, how I usually approach this, uh, this, my research. So natural ecosystems have a very high complexity and uh, usually this is correlated also with a very low controllability when you want to do experiments. And uh, on the opposite side of, um, of a natural ecosystem, maybe the most simple ecosystem uh, in which you have a lot of controllability that you can think about must be a test tube in which you put one or just a few species. And when you do this, um, in many cases, you are able to, to study the interaction network between the species, how they interact also with their environment, and, um, and you can really um, have a powerful you, you can reach good predictions about uh, what is driving the dynamics of the system. So this is how I usually start my experiments. And then once I learn about the simple system, I increase the complexity of um, the network of interactions within the microbes, or even also in the environment. For example, more recently, I've been uh, studying microbial communities inside a more, uh, the gut of, of a worm, which uh, makes the environment to be more dynamic and more uh, complex. So all of this research, I do it in, uh, in uh, constant feedback with uh, theoretically driven hypotheses. So I will start with a simple model that uh, uh, tries to capture a specific phenomenon. Then I design an experiment uh, to see if I can, I can uh, observe this and depending on my observation in many cases I have to rethink my model uh, because uh, because it obviously uh, you don't get it right at the first time and uh, so in <clears throat> so in order to apply this uh, this approach to our research we see which is the usual uh, approach that we take at the Gore lab at MIT uh, my background helped me quite a lot into this because I started my, my PhD in, in biological physics with Joachim Ford at, at the University of Girona. And there I was uh, studying um, uh, biological invasions by doing reaction diffusion equations model for, for several populations like virus infecting a cell or, or trees expanding into a new territory. This background uh, was uh, very helpful when I joined Ricard Solé, uh, Ricard Solé's lab, because there I started doing experiments for the, for the first time. Uh, that was very fun. I, I liked it a lot. And uh, we started to manipulate, uh, engineer some bacteria and manipulate their interactions so that we will see also what impact these interactions can have on the spatial patterns that they form when they are expanding into free space. Okay, so that's, uh, that was just a nutshell of uh, how I ended up at the Gore Lab. And today I'm going to talk about uh, my, my current research uh, in, in a Jeff Gore's lab. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to uh, focus on two research topics. The first one uh, asking about how communities respond to perturbations. I'm going to focus on a biotic perturbation. So I'm going to alter the composition of the, of the community directly. And uh, I, I will show a remarkable case in which uh, an, an invader can enter a community and uh, induce a transition to one, an alternative stable state of the community, even in cases in which the invader is not able to survive this transition. And later, I will focus on a different kind of uh, perturbation, specifically an abiotic perturbation in which we threaten this community 
with a, a, an antibiotic shock. And in this case, I will, uh, I will be showing some ecological drivers that you can use to control the outcome of this uh, antibiotic shock that, uh, might be <clears throat> that might be threatening different ways each of the species that we have there. Okay, so I'll begin and as, um, as I was uh, saying, this is work that I've done with Jeff Gore and my first experimental community is going to be uh, uh, made by this by stable pair of species in which I have a corinobacterium and a lactobacillus that are inhibiting each other. We have learned also that the mutual inhibition is uh, given by an antagonistic uh, interaction that these microbes have with the pH. So one of the microbes is increasing the pH, uh, sorry, decreasing the pH, which means increasing the proton concentration in the system. And when it does that, it's also benefiting from this change in the environment. While the other tries to increase the pH because a higher pH is beneficial for itself. So we can also see this when we uh, culture these two microbes in isolation. So if you have a test tube with only the green species, you will see that the pH goes up and then it stays up uh, and, this mo uh, and this helps this microbe to grow and, uh, and live in good conditions. If you start with the orange microbe, you will see the pH to go down and the microbe is able to keep the pH at, at a low value. So now we move into the community. So what, uh, what does this interaction do to these, uh, to these microbes when we put them together? So my experiments uh, are usually daily dilution based experiments. So I start by inoculating some microbes at a low density in fresh medium when, and then they can consume the nutrients and grow. I let them grow to saturation. And the next day I take a sample and I put them into fresh medium again. So we go into these cycles of growth and saturation and growth and saturation. So for this community, what I see is that when I start with a relatively high abundance of the orange microbe, this microbe can overcompete uh, is the, the green microbe and then uh, take over the population. So the main interaction that you find here is the orange inhibiting the green. However, at a low uh, initial relative abundance of the orange, we will see that its abundance goes down because the green microbe is taking over the system and therefore the dominating interaction is the green one inhibiting the orange one. This bistability is actually robust to some degree of migration. So even if I put a low uh, amount of fresh cells entering the system every day, uh, the, the two stable states of the system do not change. And with this, I have a bistable community that now I can uh, play with it and perturb in different ways to see how I can obtain transition from one to the other stable state. As I was introducing earlier, my first perturbation uh, in which I'm going to focus on is going to be an invasion perturbation. So in one of the dilutions, in addition to the migrant cells, I'm going to in inoculate a small amount of an invader cell, a species that don't belong to this community. And when you do that, there are in ecology two classical outcomes that have been broadly described, and one of them is the establishment of the invader. This happens when the invader is able to grow well and compete well with, uh, with the local community, and it leads to its establishment. And the opposite case uh, happens when the invader is a bad competitor compared to the local community, and then it ends up going into extinction, and this is known as community resilience. Can I ask a question? So in most of the cases, it's assumed that uh, if a community is resilient to an invader, uh, after the invader is uh, extinct, you just return to the previous uh, stable state. Can you ask, can However, I ask a question? There's been a largely overlooked scenario in addition to these two, which is the case in which you have an unsuccessful invader, so it doesn't compete well and it's going to, towards extinction, 
but during the time the invader remains in the community, it's uh, affecting the interaction with the other two microbes. So at the end, you could have a transition to the alternative stable state of the system. And this is what we have called the transit invader. And uh, in our, within our experiments about uh, invasion perturbations, we were wondering whether we will uh, find such a case. And actually we did, and uh, it was uh, very exciting for us. Uh, let me show you this experiment uh, in which we start with the orange microbe dominating the community in a stable way. And then one day we introduce Pseudomonas chlorographis as an invader. And we can see how Pseudomonas goes up uh, during the first hours. And by doing th that, we also see an increase in the population of the green microbe. And after just two cycles, um, Pseudomonas is reaching the extinction, but, uh, in, but the competition between the local microbes have totally changed. And uh, at the end of the experiments, we have observed a transition into the alternative stable state of the system. And now the population of the orange microbe is very low. So this means that we can see this invader as a perturbation that drive the system from one of its stable states to an alternative one, even if the invader did not to survive. So here, mm, can I ask a question? we wanted also to know about what will be the mechanisms driving this transition. And at the beginning, I tell you that uh, the orange microbe has an interaction with the pH in which uh, it, it's trying to increase the pH and benefiting from that. The opposite is true for the green microbe, which tries to to lo to sorry to increase the pH. Um, I'm not sure if I said it well before, but basically this one increases proton concentration, this one decreases proton concentration. But the interaction that the invader has with the pH is different. So this microbe will benefit from a low pH. However, if its metabolism is increasing the pH. And, uh, and when we measure the pH during the invader experiment, what we observed is that the orange microbe was keeping a low pH in the system. And right after we introduced the invader, we saw a dramatic shift uh, in, towards a high pH. And once it high pH, the green one was a better competitor than either of the other two. So here we have a mechanistic explanation for what happened to our simple experimental community. And our next question was, could we observe this in a more complex community? And uh, driven by, by this motivation, I started a completely new set of experiments. And in here, what I, what I did is to take a soil sample from the yard that it's uh, just in front of our lab. And I transfer this sample into our test tubes and again, continue with this daily dilution. So even if there are many different species coming from the soil and I don't have too much control over them, when I did it, this experiment, I observed uh, that for many different replicates, each line here, it's a different replicate, uh, the, <clears throat> the community, will go through an initial um, in, uh, transient phase of uh, some pH fluctuations, but eventually many communities, not all of them, here are more or less 50% of the ones that I tried, and the other 50 were not stable at the end of, of this amount of cycles. But for this 50%, I could see how it looks like after a few days, they have reached some stability. And when I looked, at the composition of them, I could also observe that for each of uh, the different pHs, I, I was obtaining a different community there. I'm going to focus now on this one in cream color and blue color here, because for these ones, I, I performed the next experiment. I'm gonna uh, try to see if they are also uh, stable states of the system by introducing some amount of migration between them. So I did this and I observed that even if in my daily dilutions, some of the cream microbes were coming into the blue community, the blue com 
the blue community didn't shift to the uh, to an alternative stable state and vice versa. However, in the same conditions, I applied an invader to the um, to the community with a lower pH, and uh, it's the same invader as before with my experimental community. And what we can see is that after during the course of a few cycles, the pH goes up and it stays in the range that is characteristic of the cream community. So not only this, but uh, we sequence uh, the community at the 16S level, and uh, then we could, uh, we could uh, observe what was the composition of this community. And uh, indeed, it was, uh, it was dominated by the Bacillus uh, genus during the first days, and then I introduced the invader, uh, and this pseudomonas goes up and down. And after this, we can see how uh, we have transitioned to, a, to a, an alternative community that is, in this case, governed by Pantoea. So here, again, I have this uh, invader <laughs> that listen? induces a transition to an, uh, towards an alternative stable state. And it's a good moment so to summarize that. my first part of this talk. So I've um, been showing that environmentally mediated um, interactions are important drivers of community dynamics. Sorry, yeah, Jacopo. There is a, there is a question uh, by Matteo. I, yeah, so... Oh, 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 okay. I'm sorry. So this last, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. My speakers go off if I, if there's no sound coming in a while, so I'm not sure how much time have you been. No, I, I wanted to ask a question first, but now yes. I still want to. Yes, I, it was a, yeah, I was about to say that it's a good uh, moment for questions, so please go ahead. Yeah, so, so the, the, the last example are the uh, communities homogeneous in the sense that are they dominated by a single uh, species? Yes, that's, uh, that seems to be right. Um, so, yeah, so when I look at the composition of these communities, um, in terms of colony morphologies and also where the different strains lead the pH, for the blue community, there's some heterogeneity. So I can see three different kinds of morphologies in, in these bacillus strains. And uh, some of them are more associated to a pH that it's around six, and the other ones more around four and a half or so. So there is some heterogeneity in this community. However, they are very close relatives because the 16S sequence uh, ended up being the same for all of them. And uh, for the other microbe uh, as well. So Pantoea is largely dominating this community and I only have very, um, very low fractions of other species that include all of the other species that were in the soil community, but they are, they are kept at very low levels. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Um, yeah. So at time zero, when you uh, uh, sort of have this invasion of uh, Pseudomonas, uh, mm -hmm. do you also uh, sort of put a little bit of uh, Pantoea or not? So, of the yellow species. Yes, yes, exactly. So this was uh, done under these migration conditions. Okay. Okay. So I, if I only do migration, this is the outcome. Yeah. But if I do migration in addition to the invader, then I observe this, this transition. Right. So if you don't, I mean, I guess if you just uh, have the, the invader and you don't have the migration, you are going to see that pseudomonas increase a little bit and then goes down and then you go back to the previous state. That's what I will expect. Um, I don't remember if I ever did that experiment, but an alternative possibility could be that Pseudomonas takes over. Okay. In, right, because you could think that if there's no Pantoea, the Pseudomonas is able to overcompete the Bacillus and then stay there. I but see. in this situation, Pantoea could be the one that drives Pseudomonas to extinction. Okay. But when, I mean, when you are in monodominance, it's really monodominance, so it's not that you... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. So, um, can I ask a question, as long as we're in a question period? This is Simon. Mm -hmm. um, you, at the beginning, you presented um, a, a, an equilibrium view of communities, but a standard view of 
ecological communities is that there's a successional process. <clears throat> Following a disturbance, there might be early successional species that will come in and will influence the later development, um, mm -hmm. ultimately to be replaced. And those species themselves could be uh, initiating the disturbance. So is that what we're seeing here, uh, it, it, that the, the ones that are transforming, we can think of as early successional species that are, yeah. are tr transforming the community? Yeah, I think that's right. That's uh, also a, a way to, to see it. Uh, so if we will have, like, if for whatever reason, this pseudomonas was not there from the beginning uh, or, or it cannot really um, change the environment in the way that it's supposed to change it uh, and until the bacillus is there, um, then we stayed in one state of the community. Then uh, this is, as you, as you are mentioning, Simon, this is a case in which we have a succession and this succession is yeah. um, allowed by this invader that engineers the environment somehow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good, so I was about to summarize. Uh, I think the question have helped into that. So basically I've shown that uh, these microbes, in general microbes, uh, can interact with their environment so that they change the environmental conditions and this has a feedback into the behavior of the microbe itself and it's a, an important driver of community dynamics. And as a, a remarkable example of this, I have been uh, showing this case of the transient invader who switches uh, the community from one stable state to another one without surviving the transition. And now I'm going to go into the second, uh, the second part of, the, of my talk. So as, uh, as I was introducing earlier, invasions is not the only way in which a community can shift from one stable state to another. Uh, and uh, many other perturbations are also interesting uh, in the case of microbial communities. Antibiotics are a specially interesting one for for the uh, obvious biomedical applications. Uh, so before I go into what I did experimentally, let's see about what kind of problems are we facing. So here, um, if we think about a complex community, such as the one inhabiting in our, in our gut, so the, the human gut microbiome, um, we can see that there are many factors that can influence the state in which the community is. So here we can think about the <clears throat> uh, a reasonably diverse community that inhabits the gut and, uh, and the diversity and the state of it is going to be determined by different factors such as diet and, uh, and the different species coming into the diet and whether you have functional redundancy or not. And then many other host factors such as the age and uh, the environment of the factor, of the, of the host, sorry. Uh, so in these cases, to these complex communities, in, in many cases we are uh, applying uh, an antibiotic therapy. And when this happens as a collateral damage uh, from the antibiotic, the gut suffers and, and, uh, uh, and we can see a decrease in the diversity of the microbes. So some of these microbes will just go extinct and others could uh, start dominating uh, the community either during that time or afterward. So in these different phases before, during an antibiotic and after an antibiotic, there are all these different factors that can contribute to whether the final community can recover to the previous state or it goes into a different one. And having a different state in this case can change the function of the community, so have an impact also in the health of the, of the host. But, um, but again, given the complexity of the system, it is difficult to to uh, find specific mechanisms uh, that, uh, that can help us to predict in which cases some patients do not recover and in which cases the patient will recover the previous uh, gut health that they had. So at the heart of this problem is um, that uh, 
the research on antibiotics has mainly been uh, driven by studies on single species instead of communities. So when you are uh, trying to test an antibiotic, you usually have a pathogen or a, or a specific species in mind. And when you, what you try is to see if they, this species is susceptible to the antibiotic. So here is how, uh, here is a minimum inhibitory concentration assay that it's the usual tool to assess susceptibility. So what you do is you start with, uh, with uh, an inoculum of microbes in test tubes and you have a, a gradient of the concentration of the antibiotic. So after that, you wait for a little bit of time and you see in which conditions the, the microbes grow and in which don't. And in this case, we have seen that this one here is the minimum, in, minimum inhibitory concentration. So here uh, is the concentration at which the microbes were already not able to, to grow. Depending on the antibiotics, uh, the microbes here uh, can just not grow, not grow, or they can also um, experience death. But this doesn't change how you assess the susceptibility of this microbe. So given the, that this is the most usual tool, um, a classical hypothesis to try to predict what will happen to the community is that uh, the more susceptible species, maybe they are going to experience the harshest consequences from, from an antibiotic exposure. But of course, in, in ecology, we know that uh, resilience uh, against perturbation is, um, is uh, driven by many different factors. For example, <clears throat> Here I'm showing this cartoon in which I have a community with different microbes and, uh, and there are signs of bistability, but this, this bistability can be shaped by uh, ecological conditions, uh, ecological factors such as the pH, I, as I was showing before, but also temperature or nutrient availability, even migration, so the amount of new cells that enter the community per unit time. And, such factors can influence both the shape of uh, the stability landscape and how deep are the valleys of uh, stability, but also resilience, which is how strong a perturbation can be and the system will still recover uh, the previous uh, stable state when you remove the perturbation. So in order to assess this interplay between ecological drivers and the susceptibility to antibiotics, uh, I went back to my experimental community and I started by assessing the susceptibility of my two microbes. So I did this minimum inhibitory concentration assay and uh, I observed that the green microbe was more susceptible to the antibiotic. And we can see here that the minimum inhibitory concentration to stop growth of the green microbe is much lower than the, than the orange. Uh, so based on this, if you make this classical hypothesis, you will see, oh, well, maybe then the orange microbe is going to display the more resilient state. So I started then, yes? In this case, when you say uh, resilient, you mean what is the uh, basin of attraction? So depending on the initial condition, I mean, how wide is the set of the initial condition for which you go to the attractor with the uh, orange species? Or you mean how fast you go back to the attractor? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, in this case, is for now, it's going to be more like a binary thing, whether the stable state will return to the original composition or not. Um, so actually, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be talking about relatively uh, hard or strong antibiotic perturbations. But uh, more like my, my current experiments are studying about the resilience in this, in this kind of sense about, okay, now if I vary the strength of the perturbation of the antibiotic, what's, gonna, uh, what's going to happen? But for now, I'm just gonna make a case for, for a, a relatively strong antibiotic perturbation and whether the community is resilient or not in terms of whether uh, we observe a transition or not in the stable states. So um, we, from here, we were predicting that maybe the stable state dominated by these more susceptible species 
will be um, will be less resilient to the uh, to the antibiotic shock. But what I observed in doing this experiment, in which the community starts in the green uh, in the stable state dominated by the green species, and one day I transfer it into the antibiotic, and I see how this is harming the community. Uh, then I remove the antibiotic and I let them recover. I see that uh, the green one comes back and dominates the system again. So in this case, the, this state is resilient to this antibiotic shock. And when I did the same, starting uh, from the alternative stable state dominated by the orange one, I applied a perturbation. And when I leave them recover, what I see is that the green is taking over and eventually overcompeting the, the green microbe. So somehow this, uh, this goes against the classical hypothesis based on just the susceptibility. And uh, in order to try to understand this better, we, we began by, um, by studying a simple model that maybe could capture what's happening in our community. In particular, um, I started with a modified version of the Lot Caboterra model. And here uh, I have two species. I'm, I call them F and S because of reasons that will uh, become apparent later. And for each species, so species F has a growth rate RF and it experienced logistic growth. So it's saturation of growth at high densities. And there's also another term for the interaction between the species. So the species S is inhibiting the species F and vice versa. To better capture the dynamics in my experiments, we have a constant migration rate, which is the same for both species, and a death rate that is going to be applied during for only for a uh, fraction of time. And uh, this will be an antibiotic associated growth rate. So what it means is that uh, the death rate is gonna be zero until I apply the antibiotic in which I'm gonna have different growth rates. And uh, in particular, I'm going to consider uh, that the green one is more susceptible. So the, the death rate is, uh, is higher for this one. And after the antibiotic, we go, uh, anti after the shock, we go down to uh, zero death rate again. So if everything else is equal between these two species, then the classical hypothesis uh, will, will work here because you can state with the green one uh, dominating the system and you apply the perturbation, which uh, starts killing the microbes. But then after the perturbation, the orange one uh, wins the competition against the green one, which has been more harsh, uh, more uh, harmed by the antibiotic shock. Alternatively, we can consider what you will expect in general in microbial communities, and it's that you have different growth rates. So now I'm going to consider that F has a faster growth rate than S. And if you do that in the same conditions as before, then what you can observe is the opposite. So even if you start with the less susceptible species dominating, you apply the antibiotic shock, which reduces the uh, population abundances. But then after this, the green microbe can grow faster than the other one and, and end up dominating the community. So this led me to uh, the question of whether this will be consistent, which were, were what I was observing in my experiment. So, is it the green microbe really growing faster than the other? And if so, we could make a prediction that uh, these should work for many different kinds of antibiotics uh, because it looks like uh, the importance of the growth rates can override the importance of the susceptibility. So it's not about one particular antibiotic. So <clears throat> now, I went back into the lab and I, I, I measure growth rates in several replicates. And, of, and actually we observed that the green microbe was a faster grower, so this was looking good. Uh, but then I also tried many different antibiotics. And 
in most of the case, in most of the cases, the green one was always was most more susceptible uh, when when doing these uh, minimum inhibitory concentration assays in isolation. But when I perturb them in communities, I also see that the transitions were usually going towards the green microbe, with with a few exceptions. Yeah. So this is an indication that this simple model could be capturing what is happening to this community. So here again is a good moment for questions. Uh, this, this should be a takeaway message that the FRAS growth increases the resilience against antibiotic shocks in a community context. And uh, if, uh, if that was enough, this should be the, the thing to remember from the second part of the talk. Otherwise, if you are still with me for five more minutes, I will show you how migration can also tune these growth rates and hence the, the antibiotic response. Is there any questions so far? Okay. So when I was measuring the growth rates, I also observed that, my <clears throat> that the green microbe was a, exhibiting some signatures of cooperative growth. And what this means is that for different initial cell densities, I will observe a different growth rate for the green microbe, while the orange microbe was mostly growing at the same growth rate, no matter the initial density. So in the model, this is usually captured by applying an Ali effect, which, um, which consists in an additional term into the growth rate of, of the microbe, in, in this case, the fast microbe, the fast grower. And this Ali effect, uh, when we use this form of the Ali effect, what we see is that the capita growth rate will grow, but then, uh, sorry, go down as you go down in the initial population density. For comparison, the, the orange microbe is ex, uh, it's, uh, experiencing only logistic growth here. So what happens when we introduce this into our, into our theoretical model? So before we were in the absence of growth, this was my modified set of equations for the lotka volterra model. And uh, what I'm showing here is how the basing subtractions are for the, for the two stables. So wherever you start in this uh, initial population density range, you will end up with the green one dominating in this, uh, in this region of the phase space. However, if you, if you go into a higher initial abundance of the orange one, then you can reach uh, a stable state dominated by the orange. What I'm showing here, uh, it's, a, it's an example of a perturbation, an antibiotic that is uh, harming both of the species at the same rate. So depending on whether this is the case or not, you will have different inclinations of the arrow. But here, if you are in the stable state, you threaten the microbial community in this way, then you leave them recovery, and it could come back to the uh, initial uh, stable state. If the perturbation is harsher, then there is a risk of crossing the, the interface between two basins of attraction, and then is when you can observe the transition towards the green one dominating. So how this changes when you have Ali effects? Uh, so if we draw the same phase space here, we will see how this, um, this boundary between the two phases curves in a different way. And now the basin of attraction of the orange microbe is much uh, uh, bigger than the, the one for the green microbe. Okay, so it, so we have this prediction that cooperative growth can change the resilience of alternative stable states. And the next question is, could I apply this to observe in my system uh, uh, a change in the direction of these transitions? And the answer could, uh, it looked like the, like the answer could be found in the migration because migration establishes a floor in the population densities. So let's imagine a harsh perturbation of the antibiotics, so only a few cells survive, and then I dilute them into fresh nutrients. But I also have 
uh, some amount of migrants that are going to come and they are going to be responsible as well for the repopulation of the system. If I increase migration, even if uh, the rates of migration, the, the fraction of the migrants are the same for both species, we will have a higher initial population density right after the shock. And uh, given the cooperative growth of the green species, it could, this could have an effect on the, on the difference in growth rates between the two of them. And after doing this analysis, I realized that I, my migration rate would set up uh, a floor in the population densities that was more or less over here. So the prediction was that maybe if we lower the uh, migration rate, we will reduce the difference uh, in the initial growth rates after the antibiotics and maybe for many antibiotics, we will observe a transition in the opposite direction. Sorry, uh, Dan. Yes. I'm not sure mm -hmm. I understand. So what, what you're saying is, uh, well, migration sets the floor of population density and mm -hmm. to observably effect, I need to be at a small enough population. Mm -hmm. And therefore I see that effect if I have a low enough migration. Is that what you're saying? Or, uh, uh, excuse me, I didn't hear well the second part of the question. Can Okay. I mean, what I don't understand is how these, um, I mean, uh, what is the connection between uh, migration and uh, a Right. Effect? Okay. So imagine, let's imagine an extreme case in which the, the, um, the antibiotic is killing the whole population. It's, that's the extreme. And then what happens the next day is that you don't transfer any cells from here, but there is the migration rate that, uh, so some cells will come into the system because of the migration rate. If the total migration rate is low, then you will have an initial population density that maybe it's around here. So you have this growth rate for one species, this growth rate for the other. If you increase the migration rate a little bit, maybe you are going to start from here or from here. And this is going yeah, to change. I was, trying to understand that. I was trying to understand that in terms of the parameters of the model with the Ali effect. So what you're saying is that you should compare the migration oh. rate with the parameter A, with, which appears in the- Yes, right? yes, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, so if the migration rate is small enough, then you, are, you can see the effect of the Ali effect. If it is large enough, you are already above uh, the, the Yes, A yes, you are right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The migration rate will set up uh, where you are in this curve if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So the last thing to check was whether we could lower the migration rate and, and uh, see if this had an effect on the reaction of the community to antibiotics. And uh, just a reminder, when I was in my original migration rate, which uh, now I'm going to call the high migration uh, rate condition, uh, the orange microbe was able, th sorry, the green microbe was always able to take over the community after an antibiotic shock, no matter which state I begin with. So high migration means that you have transitions towards the green microbe dominating the system. Now I did these same experiments at a low migration rate, and we actually observed a transition towards the orange uh, microbe. So I begin with the green one, I apply the perturbation, the migration rate is low, so the green microbe is still a faster grower, but the difference is lower, and we have to take into account also the inhibitor interactions between them. So this allows the microbe, the orange microbe, to overcompete its uh, the the other species and we also observe that if you start with the orange uh, microbe dominating the system you end up with the orange dominating the system so this not only happened for one antibiotic but for many of them so when i when i lower the migration rate and i apply uh, different antibiotics to this community I will observe transitions predominantly going to the orange microbe, or in some cases, both the stable states 
remain uh, resilient to to the to the uh, perturbation, so no changes. But if I apply a higher migration rate, then I'm going uh, preferentially to the green microbe. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. So um, uh, I see uh, error bars on your plot. So you are averaging mm -hmm. on uh, a different uh, realizations of yeah, these, these uh, experiments. Right? So uh, yeah, here are you... three three different experiments for each of the plots. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. But in all of three, in all of them, you observe the same outcome, or uh, can you observe also a metastable outcome? Um, so for the ones that I'm plotting here, I always observe the same outcome. Um, I do not observe metal stable outcomes in the long term. If meta stable means that none of them is going to dominate and they are going to coexist more or less at the same fraction. What I can observe, depending on the on the uh, strength of the perturbation, um, because if the perturbation is very weak and you only put a little bit of antibiotic then this is not going to do anything to the microbe so you mm -hmm. at some range you don't observe transitions and then you start uh, observing transitions and i'm here showing that the migration rate can also reverse the direction of these transitions going to the green or going to the orange so when you are at uh, in in experimental parameters that are in between this decision. Sometimes mm -hmm. I observe that, uh, that if I do three replicates, one will go in one direction and two will go in the other direction. Okay. But it's just Thanks. for very small ranges of parameters. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so this, this was all. Um, just to summarize, I, I was showing how environmentally mediated interactions can be an important driver for community dynamics. Um, and then this can lead to remarkable dynamics, such as the one from the transit invader, who induces a switch from one stable state of the community to an alternative one. And we could, in this case, by studying simple communities in the lab, isolate uh, specific mechanisms that can drive this transition. And, um, and finally, um, beyond these environmental immediate interactions, there are also other uh, ecological drivers that uh, we could study more in depth and uh, exploit to control the outcome of microbial communities after perturbations such as antibiotic shocks. And uh, with this, yes, and, and as I was uh, mentioning to Jacopo, right now, the, the second part of my talk is ongoing work. And what I'm doing right now is going into these regions of parameters in which uh, the different factors are more equilibrated in their impact. So what, what happens, the susceptibility is more or less as important as the difference in growth rate, for example. Um, and with this, I would like just to thank you Thank you, my, uh, thank you, Jeff, um, which is my, my current advisor, but also my previous advisors uh, from which uh, I, I learn a lot from all of them. And uh, my, my colleagues and, and collaborators, Christoph Ratke, uh, which is an author in, in the paper about the transient invader, and many other friends that uh, are helping me uh, very, uh, in my everyday life, like Martina, Jonathan Friedman, and many others. Uh, with that, I would like to thank question uh, to um, answer any questions that you may have. And thank you. Let me clap for everyone. Thanks a lot. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the first experiment. Um, yeah. So you said that the mechanistic interpretation for why the invaders shifts the community to the other stable state is that the invader um, increases the pH. But so I was wondering if you tried to just uh, change the pH in the community without uh, putting the invader and seeing if it has the same effect? Yeah, yeah, we did that in, and it has exactly the same effect. Uh, with, with the pH, you can control in an intuitive way where you drive the community. So low pH, you go to one microbe dominating, 
and high pH shock and you get the other one. Hello. Hi. Hi, I have a question uh, not directly related to your talk, but uh, just want to know if there are studies on if you control the nutrients like in a periodic way. That's kind of more like what we do uh, daily, you know, with the food coming in and so on. And if we go, if we change these hours, for example, making it irregular or even with some fasting period, uh, what would be your uh, prediction? Whether it's going to be a significant change in the composition of the microbiota, or you know, and maybe it's too general question, but <laughs> I want to know, you know. No, no, it's a, any, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good question. I'm I'm thinking about the impact. So my view of uh, the the effects that noon has uh, on microbial communities usually. Um, I think that a higher nutrient availability increases the competition strength between the species. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you have a lower availability to nutrients, uh, the microbes not only might grow slower, but also they, some of them might be lacking some nutrients, so they relay on, on mutualisms. Uh, so one mm -hmm. microbe will be producing this chemical that they cannot find in the environment. Right, and right. Uh, you increase the nutrients and the nutrient availability, and then you remove these dependencies uh, because mm -hmm. they just cannot take it from the environment, and now right. they are just competing to grow and overtake the yeah. system. So instead of changing the concentration, if you change the timing of it, yeah, I think it's going to depend as well as what happens once you reach, you reach some saturation and some of them mm -hmm. might be secreting toxins that are uh, that are yeah, bad for, for the others um, so it definitely changes the <laughs> it definitely yeah. changes the composition and the stability but uh, i i wouldn't be able in an abstract way to say in which uh, mm -hmm. in which direction specifically it's going to change. Yeah, I understand it's very complicated question. But if we have sufficient understanding, it may kind of design some uh, some schedule, right? For people yeah. who like to eat, but then they worry about getting fat and so on, right? That, okay. That, okay. That's right. And uh, and I think that uh, in it can help to do it for particular sets of uh, for particular sets of communities or, or sets mm. of species. Um, okay, more thank than, you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good. Any other question? Well, I have a question. Oh, Mateo, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, no, I'm wondering uh, uh, to what extent uh, in such a simple system uh, one can uh, validate uh, theoretical models. So, um, so for example, uh, well, you, you can describe this with this uh, as an evolutionary game. You know? So you can write down equations. So the question is, can you really estimate uh, uh, the utility functions uh, of uh, the different bacteria in this uh, uh, evolutionary game? Uh, from, I mean, at least to test whether uh, uh, this paradigm in a simple system is really what is going on. Yeah, so my answer will be that with simple communities, we are reaching the state in which we can really quantify much of, uh, of ecological and evolutionary drivers there. So here I haven't shown it, but, uh, but this um, this phase space of uh, the two stable states and the and the basin of attraction for the two stable space, that's something that you that I have studied experimentally. So you you can really tune the range of uh, initial concentrations of the two microbes, and you really have in in one experimental plate you will actually see because you have the different uh, population densities by each microbe. You really see that there is the the separatrix there in your in your actual experimental plate, um, and in in these cases when you have 
two or three or four um, microbes that you have previously studied really well in the lab. I think the, the ability that we have right now to ask a quantitative question and go and measure it, uh, that's very high. And the challenge right now is to go into more complex communities. So more than, yeah, more than five species or even going into uh, comparing these to, to a soil community, for example, in which the initial number of the species is astonishing. That, that, does that answer your question? No, yes, yeah, no. I mean, the issue is that uh, if you can uh, validate uh, models uh, uh, in this simple system, maybe then uh, you can uh, think uh, uh, that you can study models with many species uh, uh, also from theoretical point of view. I mean, uh, extended. Yeah, this, exactly. Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, with one of the grad students at the Gore Lab right now, we are taking this approach in which um, we start with complex communities and uh, the model is based on, on statistical physics tools. So now you, you start thinking about, um, about the, the community as if you could average the properties of the different species and predict uh, what's going to be the abundance of the average species in the system, right? Uh, so this is kind of going a step forward. I'm, we are not able to predict there what happens to one particular species, but when we look at the statistical properties of the community, we are finding very promising and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, compelling results about how can we apply these different modeling tools to to our communities in the lab. Mm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, is there any other question? Hi, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes, please. Um, I, I will first introduce myself briefly. I'm Xin. I'm recently a graduate from Geosciences Princeton University, but I will start a postdoc position with Alvaro Sanchez who was in your current mm -hmm. lab. Um, and sorry if I crashed the <laughs> seminar today, but it's a very interesting seminar. And I wasn't thinking about these problems. So I have a kind of a basic question, which is what is, wh when can you call a microbial community stable? Cause like I thought stable community means that if there are some perturbations, it can still remain the same. But it seems that you're talking about adding uh, somewhat stronger perturbation, so the microbial community community shift. So I was thinking, is there a way to, like, uh, is there a criteria to tell us what is a stable community? So in in my experiences, uh, yeah, thank you, Shin, for your question. In my experiences, um, there is always a matter of definition. So what do you mean by stability? When um, and resilience. And uh, it can change from study to study. In my case here, um, well, first I, my approach is that if you go into very, very strong perturbations, no community are going to be stable, right? So there's always a limit. Um, so because of that, I understand stability as a relative, uh, uh, constancy or persistence of population abundances and ecological functions. And, uh, and the resilience is how, my, how strong the perturbation, yeah. The resilience is related to the strength of the perturbation that this, the community can endure without, uh, without experiencing a change in the, in the stable state in which they are. Hmm. That's, is that uh, answering your question? Yeah, thank you. So it's thank more you. of a relative. Uh, yes, state. I think it's always going to be a little bit relative, uh, but we can learn once you define and what you mean. Uh, and you, yeah, once you define what you mean by it, then we can learn about, um, about these concepts. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, I think, uh, um, it's time to thank again uh, uh, Daniel for giving this seminar.